couple k's. And so we will jump right in to our questions. All right, so last meeting, um, we ended with just having the discussion or having the opportunity to discuss kind of what the book um, is about with a family member or a friend to see if they have any personal experiences or stories or if they, you know, connected to anything um, that happened in the book. So I would like to know if anybody had the opportunity to do that, if there's any stories or experiences you'd like to share with us today. Um, for me, I guess I'll go first. I know that there was one part in the book. Let's see. Let me try and find it again. Sorry. It was chapter, or page 103 where they were talking about crossing the Mekong River. And one story that my dad always told me um, when I was younger. So when he was a kid is when he left Laos and went to Thailand and he had to cross the Mekong River. And so they say in chapter, oh gosh, I don't remember what chapter it was, but page 103, um, the rest of us would make do by cutting stretches of bamboo to use as floats. So I know there's one story. He always told all the time, he cut 10 pieces of bamboo tied it together, stuck it underneath his arms, and that's what he used to float across the Mekong River. I'm not sure if he could swim or not, or if he just kind of paddled, but that, I remember him telling me this story, and so when I read that, I was like, oh, this is just like how my dad described. So I thought that was really interesting how that was kind of a similarity there. So does anybody have a story or experience they'd like to share? Thanks for sharing that, April. Um, this weekend, we're doing a family reunion, and as I'm sure you guys, some of you guys um, will get together, there might be that one mom that's like, okay, there's nothing in home, right? And my mom, of course, is like, okay, don't bring your fake salt, bring the real one. I'm like, mom, it's like a thousand pounds, you know? But I had to go dig it up, and I was kind of, I'm kind of um, dreading it, but then I remember in the book when um, you know, when she got married, her mom gave her it was all like a real one, and and I just thought it was so. Um, to me, I you think about like the whole, you know, they moved within a few years. They moved so many times, almost every three four months, and every time the mom, you know, like she carried the and she had a few daughters. So I wonder if she had like it was all for every daughter. But so like for her experience, right? She's like, well, let me just get my sandals, my clothes, you know, up my pot. But for the mom, every time they move, you know, solve for all her daughters and just think like that was so important to her. And so when my mom can ask me for me to bring my real salt, I was like, you know, it's really important for her because it holds that much more uh, meaning than it does to me. But because I, you know, and I don't know that I'll ever really truly understand it. But having read this story this week, I was like. I won't put up a fight, you know, I'll just bring my real style because um, it was just so interesting to see the parallels of how important faith for your mom mothers, what that symbolizes, right? It was solid, you know, um, and so like really for them, like through war and everything, like that was so symbolic and so important. And I was so sad for her when she lost it, when she was crossing the cone, right? And so um, anyway, that happened this week and I was like, you know, there are some things that as we get older and d detached from that, uh, long experience, you know, there are reminders that kind of bring us back and go, you know, the, the, uh, parallel and the symbolism is still there. So even for my daughter, like a, you know, the fake, um, lighter ones for her. And I'm like, I would never make my daughter wear those really heavy ones, but who knows when I might pass it on be like wear it one time you know because it's one of those things like you need, oh, you need a pass down right and so if I pass it down to my daughter I hope that she'll treasure it just as much as or learn to treasure it a little bit just as much as I've had to learn so that was something that happened yeah um just piggybacking off of that um a few days ago my mom was actually showing off her soul that um like actually made um in laos for her and she brought it to the u.s and was able to keep it all these years and she was talking about how like she was gonna sell it and we're like no don't sell it that like 
that's like it's not even about the money it's about the fact that you brought it from laos and like grandma had it made for you you know that's like that's part of our heritage that's part of our legacy you know and so especially you know you know those are really hard to come by nowadays because they're mass producing all those out in china now and like you can't even sometimes you can't even tell which one's real which one's fake anymore right and so um just piggybacking off of that All right, does anybody have any other connection or story or experience they'd like to share? Yeah, um, you know, I, there, some of the, many of the chapters, there were just moments when, I don't know about you, but I was reading and crying and reading and crying and reading and crying. And um, I thought a lot about um, my own story of coming here and my mom, um, April's grandma. Um, so when I, I was uh, probably three, so a little bit older than Doe, but like the story about like, um, you know, when they crossed over and they got across and they're like, what's, is your baby okay? <laughs> right? Like, and, and she thought her baby may, may have died, swallowed all that water. And then the baby opened the eyes and um, this was on 106. And at the end, she was like, the sun came up and they opened her eyes and I saw the bit of brown. I knew the strength of my baby spirit. Her hold, you know, her hold onto life in the and felt in my own a stirring response, um, really about mothering, and um, it just reminded me of my own little spirit to like to live. Um, I was one of the babies that um, was fed opium to quiet me down. I think they talked about that in the book as well. That many many babies were fed opium, and so um, so that you would you know you wouldn't. Uh, get the soldier's attention, right? And um, and we had like three attempts to cross the Mekong River. And, um, you know, it was the second one where we almost drowned and didn't make it. And that was when I was um, fed opium. And my mom thought that she had like over, like I, she had killed me because I wasn't hardly breathing. Um, so I thought a lot about like my own experience as a baby, so helpless you really were just at the helm of like other people in the mighty river and the kindness of people at that time, like our last attempt, it was the kindness of like some big Hmong group that allowed us to join them to get on a boat. And then that last time we just got ferried across. Um, but like throughout their whole jungle experience, trying to, um, you know, get to safety and all of that. It was just like the chaos the chaos of having a child in the jungle and um and yet it was like the joy like that how that that their her babies gave her purpose during this crazy time you know and i do remember having a conversation with my mom about like mom how did you have the courage to leave because you know lan chai you buy lan chai because it was so much unknown. You don't know what's on the other side of the river either, you know, and people coming, going to other countries, you don't know what life is like there. And I remember she saying to me, um, like, yeah, it's scary being here, but you, your desire to live for your children. And so like, I thought about like the sense of purpose that like, um, Kao Kelly's mom had, like, it's these babies. And even in the refugee camp, Right. Finally, her decision to be like, I need to leave the refugee camp because my babies, they need a better life. Like the power of children. I don't have any children of my own, but like the power of children to give you purpose. Um, I thought a lot about that. And I just have so much um, love and appreciation for my mom to really try to keep us safe. It's it's so challenging. You're just trying to survive yourself. And then you have these little babies that you have to like take care of. Um, so such so much appreciation for our elders um, who really got us to where we are today. Yeah. And I, I also think about how she was also like a baby when she had her first baby too. So it was like a baby trying to keep a baby alive while she goes through the forest and everything and so it must have been extremely difficult like I don't 
I, I remember underlining a part where she was like, I'm barely 20 or something. Um, and I was like, but wow, you all like while reading, you forget that she's that young going through all of this. Right, does anybody have anybody or sorry, anything else they'd like to share? Yeah, I'd like to sh share something brief. Um, so I was talking to my husband and I was like, hey, like, how did your parents get to America? And he was like, on an airplane. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, like, really? Like, how did they get to America? And um, he said that because I guess it's kind of like, kind of like a, like a joke, not joke in their family. But wherever my, wherever his parents were living at the time, they were kind of sheltered away from all the war that was happening. So um, his parents actually did not have to cross the river. They did not have to live in the jungle and kind of just like fend for themselves on the daily. Um, and then, you know, of course, eventually they did make it to the refugee camp and then they didn't make their way over here. But I just thought that was really interesting, you know, because I feel like a lot of times I hear more stories about them, you know, are people surviving in the jungle, like having to give their babies opium to make them quiet, losing family members, losing things that were precious to them, and then having to ultimately like cross the river that claims so many lives to just to not know what's on the other side. Um, but yeah, so I was like, oh, wow, like that was really interesting. And so um, I think that's, that's why I was really like, you know, to, especially to my husband and then like even some of his sisters, I was like, you guys should really read this book. Like, it's just, I don't know, like, cause even for me, like hearing firsthand stories, it's kind of like, there's something about seeing it written in text and then kind of, even as you're, you're reading everyone else's stories, like it just for sure, like brings as so much respect for the elders, um, kind of like when you were saying, um, just everything that they had to go through to get to where we are today. Yeah, I think it's really interesting how there are a lot of different perspectives, you know, that we might not hear a lot of different journeys. Um, this is, you know, one, one story, one way of how it went, but there are definitely lots of different stories, um, different experiences that we don't know about. And I think it's really interesting that, you know, even as Hmong people, we're learning all these different experiences that, you know, our people went through, because it's not just one linear story. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, but thank you guys for being so vulnerable and sharing these stories. I know it's not easy. Um, it's not a, it's not a soft topic. So thank you guys for being vulnerable and uh, sharing these stories with us. All right, so for our next question, it kind of goes along with a little bit of everything that we've kind of talked about, but I think it's really interesting um, how many themes that she's kind of integrated into the story. So I'd like to know what theme you identify the most with or you think, you know, is the most powerful theme um, and why that, why you identify with that. And then I have some examples here. So motherhood, of course, womanhood, love, longing, home, and surviving. I think for me, her sense of purpose with her children, um, how like she like new touched on this about how her children gave her purpose in the refugee camps. And I think about like my mom, how my mom wasn't my mom and pa my parents married when they came to the States. So they um, <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry. Um. So, um, but just surviving here in the South and like working in factories and manufacturing jobs and like dealing with all the racism and stuff like that, like um, just being, dealing with it and saying, you know, I'm doing this for my children so that they can have better lives, so that they can have better jobs, they can have more opportunities. And so um, just having, having, because I think for our generation, we're always like, we're, we're taught to like, follow our passions and, you know, find our purpose and like, you know, um, you know, um, lead lives that are like, filled with like purpose and stuff like that. But for our mothers, it's like, be a mother, be a good mother to us, be a good mother to our children, no matter how many you have, be a good mother, you know, so. Um, yes, I, I'm going to have to say, you know, I'm not a mom, um, but motherhood and womanhood, I think kind of combined a little bit, 
Um, definitely, I think I've gained some new insight, some sort of new respect for my mother. Um, when I think about everything that she's had to, you know, endure and, you know, when she's growing up, like you said, she, it's a, it's a lot about be a good mom, be a good woman, be a good girl, be a good housewife, things like that. Um, and so I think that that's just something that I really connected with, something that I kind of opened my mind a little bit about, you know, my mom and her experiences and how she grew up and how she's raised, you know, my, my siblings and I, um, so I definitely think womanhood, motherhood combined, not from my personal experiences, but for, you know, how I view my mother and how I view um, other Hmong women. Hey, so my husband, Ninun Beng Hmong, we never call him this Beng Hmong until he got his below, but Ninun Beng Hmong and B. So the whole time I'm reading this, I'm like, oh my God. Are they talking about my husband and how she's talking about like my husband's poor? Did you want a chili? I'm like, that's my husband, you know. I'm like, um, but then like, you know, like like she the way she described it was so humbling too. Like, did you want a chili? But he has he's my friend, right? Um, and that's how I view my husband too. Like, you know, we're friends, um, first and foremost. But um, one of the things I identified was uh with and kind of like you know, saying what Doha was talking about. As Hmong women, I think um, when you get married, for some reason, right, um, as soon as you get married, you're no longer Tia. Now you're Nyan, Nyan B, Nyan B, right? And that for me was so hard, you guys. Like, um, So like if my in-laws, you know, anybody on my in-law side calls me that, sure, that's how you guys know me. But it was really hard for me to hear my own parents call me that. And I really fought back. I was like, you guys, you gave birth to me. Please don't call me Nian Zombi, right? So he's a Beilao now, so Zombi. And they were really confused. They're like, what do you mean? We thought we were honoring you by recognizing that you know, they're they're happy for us. And that's why she wants to call me that. But I'm like, mom, that hurts my feelings. Please stop calling me because when you do that, I feel like this the separation of me from you guys. But when you think about like in the Hmong tradition, you know, like um, she described in the book, like your spirit now belongs to this new family. Like that in itself breaks my heart too. And I'm, I, I'm so like, I tell her on how much of that I want to um, carry on with my, how I view that with my own children, you know, um, or how important it is, you know, if my daughter were to marry a Hmong person, because I feel like no matter what, like, those are, these are my birth parents, you know, and so I feel like, and then like, they call you by your husband's name and you lose your identity, you know, like, um, but it just, just depends on how your husband feels too. My husband, he doesn't care. He doesn't, he never calls me any of that. Like, even when he's talking to my parents, he's like Tia, you know, or Tia, whatever. Um, and so I, you know, even um, with my in-laws, the ones that I have a relationship with, they're like, do you want our kids to call you Auntie Tommy or Auntie Tia? I'm like, Auntie Tia, you know, so like from the very beginning, because I think it's so important for us small women to, to some, you know, advocate for ourselves and maintain our identity because if you don't, you're gonna lose it so quickly. That's how yambi and it gets really tricky because then no matter what, um, you know, just by uh, how the world works, you know, you kind of do lose your sense of identity. So I'm holding on really tightly to that, and um, you know, same with uh, like what is what did they call her? Uh, Donia, right? Like. No, you're not, and you're now your husband's wife and your child's mother. You don't have your name. Nobody ever calls you that anymore. So I don't think so. My my first born name be y'all, uh, uh, Owen Chiming. But like you know, that's one thing that my mom, my mom, she hasn't done that to where she's like Owen Neo or anything. But she she's silly. She's more than Tyson So she's um she likes to give us nicknames, but she does call me. Um, Donia. I'm like, mom, my my sister and I, we both have sons, right? And so it, she's trying so hard to carry on these traditions that I'm just like, well, whatever, mom, you know, like, I'm Tia, right? And so anyway, the theme that I it really resonated with me is I love just how, um, regardless of the fact that this was written in, what, the 60s, 70s, 80s, like, there's still that theme where um, I loved it when she was like, and when I went to uh, get her, uh, I guess she was in high school, right? Even though she was in her 20s, she was in high school. She was like, I loved it that I could write my own name. I thought, yeah, so right? how powerful that you're fighting just to write your own name because all that's taken away from you, right? So those themes, um, I think for the longest time, I thought, 
you know, we're fighting this system, we're fighting this uphill battle for the patriarchy and, you know, more women who have just accepted this. But um, I, it was just so, um, for me, enlightening to go, no, there were other home women going through the same thing, also having the same fight. And, you know, maybe because of their fight, it's easier for our generation to even have this conversation where I can openly tell you guys, I hate being Kanye and being Yadby, you know, because these women kind of like already started those conversations in the 80s. And they, that they led us to where we are. And the amazing Gal Khalil wrote this book to kind of expose the things that Hmong women have really been dealing with all these years. You know, so it's not a new thing. It's just a conversation that's being had openly. So I really appreciate that. And I see in the chat, um, Bira, I completely relate to that too. Um, yes, I also relate to that as well. And <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that, Tia. Um, I'm still getting used to it. I'm newly married. I want to say it's only been a year and a half. And so when I go to church and people, people say like, oh, near Ricky, you're like, near Ricky. I'm like, who? Me? <laughs> I'm like, oh, yes, that's me now. <laughs> So I'm still getting used to it myself and then the sense of identity. And one thing I do want to point out is um, I forgot exactly what chapter because I'm listening to the audiobook, but she mentions how she mentioned a few times how she was very like meticulous and how she does things and how she takes her time. And um, I feel like I, I relate to that as well. And then also like, I guess she also mentions later on in the book how I don't know if it was her mother-in-law or if it was her sister-in-law. They said something along the lines of like, oh, you know, uh, now he's very slow and whatnot. And she started crying about it. And I was like, oh, my goodness, because she talked about how like her mom never used that against her and how she like thought of it more as a pro than a con um, and used more like uplifting and, you know, words of growth Uh you know, to explain her meticulousness, but I thought, I sort of thought about that as well, and my in-laws are very sweet, so they didn't say anything, like, mean to me, but um, my parents did raise me to be a little bit more outspoken, and um, I guess I wouldn't say, like, opinionated, but I guess I, I go ahead and use that word, <laughs> more opinionated, more outspoken, and just, I, I don't hold back on you know, what I want to say and like my truth. And um, I tend to be very honest. Um, however, like my, my husband's family, they're a little bit more reserved. So I think it sort of takes his, his parents like a back a bit when I'm a little bit more outspoken about like how I feel. And then sometimes I feel like I have to reel myself in a bit and be like, oh, yeah, you know, like, <laughs> because they are like, I guess, a little bit more reserved and and how they are. Um, but that's how I sort of like related is that self-identity and then also just um, the difference of, I guess, like being raised, like that difficulty, that difficulty of like adjusting to a different family. Um, well, I a through line for me, um, I love all the things that you all mentioned um, that I kept coming back to was I, I really felt like as I was reading the book, um, it's like a love letter to her mom. And it was like all the things that she never been, was able to say, her longing for her mother, um, the feeling of never being home. And, you know, like when you were with your mom, uh, once you move away from mom. And um, it, that, that really resonates with me. I, I feel like my own journey with my mom, um, it's been really long and challenging and beautiful. You know, like in the Hmong culture, I don't know about you, all of you, but like with my mom, cause she's older, you know, um, and from the older generation, you don't say, I love you to each other very much. You don't hug, you, you don't do that. And I'm 48 and I'm going to get emotional. So just bear with me. I'm 48. And in my, when I moved to Minnesota, I started working with some teens and I, at one of the retreats, I decided 
I'm going to start to tell my mom I love her before. Like, it's never too late to begin something new. And I made that like intentional decision in my late 20s. And it didn't happen probably into my 30s, mid 30s. Because it was so hard when it's not in your culture to like verbally express love to somebody you really care for. It's so hard to say it. I would I would see her. I would want to like embrace her, but we're not used to hugging either. And so it was awkward. <laughs> so we just stand there awkwardly. Okay, bye. Or I'm so glad you're here. And I couldn't say I love you until much later on, but I started hugging her. And I remember the first time I hugged her, she was just like a robot, like, okay, what are you doing? <laughs> we don't do this. This is awkward. But she would just let me hug her anyway, especially when I'm going to go home because I live I live four hours right away. She, she lives in Wisconsin. And so then over the years, she would start to embrace me back. But that wasn't until like maybe six, seven years after I've been hugging her as a statue. And I started to say, I love you. More recently, in my 40s, I would just say it, be like, I love you, bye, and get my car and go home. <laughs> and then next time, it would be a little bit longer embrace. Mom, I love you, bye. And she'd be like, okay, bye, okay. And y'all, this past June, I went to stay with her for three weeks because my other brother and the, their family went to Thailand. And the day I was packing to come home, she said, I love you back. This is making y'all 30 years in the making. She, I didn't even say it to her, but she was like, Minta, I, I'm going to really miss you. You know, like, I'm going to feel the cold next to my bed because I would always sleep with her when I go back home visit. And um, it was just so affirming that like, y'all it is never too late, right? It's never too late to do the things which we think in, my, in our culture, it's impossible to do. Just got to keep on trying. And I was like, oh man, my mom and my, our love letter has been going on for a long time. <laughs> Us trying to communicate to each other how much we care about each other. And then the book just reminded me of my own journey because, you know, it was like that last moment where she was like, when they were going to depart. And she's like, I know my mom wanted to say something to me, but she couldn't and she didn't. And she just said something really simple. And I miss her. I'm here with strangers. I long for my mom. And I remember my mom, you know, she always gives me money when I go home. And I'm like, mom, I have money. I don't need your money. She does farmer's market. And I'm like, I don't need your money. And, but she always stu stuffs it in my fanny pack. She finds a way. And she's like, Mintai, nobody loves you like your mother. And I was like, that's so true, y'all. Nobody will love us like our moms. And um, it just made me like more, uh, more persistent in like reminding myself to show love to those who we really care about, uh, especially if we haven't done so. Um, because time is short, we just never know. We never know. Um, so keep reaching for each other. I guess that's the thing I'm, I'm she was she's constantly reaching right the book for her mom and that just reminded me to con constantly continue to reach for my mom as well i think um in college i took this women and gender studies class called mothers and daughters and we had to interview like our mother or grandmother or a female figure in our family so I interviewed my mom and we were like, I remember it because we were killing chicken and uh, we were like in the middle of like plucking the chicken and stuff like that. And I was like, mom, what is it that you want to pass down to your children? And she's like, I thought it was such a, I thought it was simple. I thought it was education, you know, the value of education. But she said it in like almost a whisper and she was like, love, you know, and, um, 
I don't know. I've always grown up hugging my mom and saying, I love you. Make sure you drive safely home and stuff like that because she worked the graveyard shift. And so that's always been kind of normal for me. But like when my friends would see me do that, they're like, why are you doing that? And I'm like, because it's my mom. I love my mom. I always hug my mom. You know, I hug her and kiss her. And even with my dad, like um, we like slow dance at like the New Year's parties and all those parties and stuff like that. And they're like, why are you dancing with your dad? I'm like, it's my dad. Of course I'm going to dance with him, you know? And so it's like simple things like that I take for granted because like I know that I'm very like, I'm very touchy-feely, you know, and I'm very hands-on with my parents because, you know, like sometimes like you never know when they're going to pass, right? And they're getting older and like sometimes like I just want to say I love you. I call just to see how you're doing, you know, uh, even if you're away for like one weekend, they're like, oh, good, oh, good, yeah. and I'm like, yeah, I miss my mom because it's true. A mother's love is un- unconditional and uh, unforgivable, uh, uh, un- uh, unattainable, you know, so. I just want to share like, you know, growing up, my parents, I've- my, my well, all my friends would be like oh, like I'd go to my friend's house right and their parents would be like hugging each other kissing each other holding hands and I was like that's so weird I've never seen my mom and dad do that like what is that you know um and then I I remember watching the show and they were like saying to their mom like oh I love you to their mom and dad and I was like I literally never said that before to them and I had this like epiphany in like high school I was like oh, I gotta start doing that like what is this like everybody's doing it I'm not doing it and I remember like it was like over the phone I decided, I just decided one day, you know, to do it over the phone. I was like, okay, bye. I love you. Hung up. And I was just like, every time they'd call, I'd be like, okay, bye. I love you. And then I, the longer I waited to see like, oh, would they say it back? And then eventually, I think it was my dad. He was like, bye. I love you. And hung up first. And I was like, what the heck? And then after I started doing it, my sister started doing it. Gosh, now I'm crying. My aunt made me cry. Now I'm crying. <laughs> And, um, yeah, after that, like, I would do it, like, at, at the in the kitchen, like, okay, bye, I love you. And then eventually, my parents got so used to saying it, um, my sibling, like, my younger sibling started going, okay, bye, I love you. And it'd be, like, the most, like, mundane tone, you know, like, monotone, but at least they said it, you know. And then eventually, like, I mean, I still don't really hug my parents, but we do for, like, you know, if it's a special occasion or if we're going on vacation and we're going to be separated from them. And even, like, in high school, when I'd go on, like, club trips, I'd call them and my son's like what are you doing and I'm like I'm calling my mom you know like or my sisters would be like why like I'd be like oh yeah I called them I told them like this is what we're doing and they're like you were only gone for like a day and I was like but they want to know you know I think they want to know what's going on and I remember my dad was like oh thank you for telling us what you're doing you know so a lot during like um even to her um like in the book there's a part where she was leaving the refugee camp and it was just to her mother-in-law and she's like there's so many things I want to say but all she ended up saying was like I'm gonna miss you but I think even that was like that's just showing some emotion even to her mother-in-law you know so I just thought like there's just so much like as a Hmong as a Hmong community like we don't talk about our feelings we don't show like this emotion um like they say I love you and everything so I do think that you know, when I was reading that, like, that definitely hit me, um, you know, it's so common between all of us, like, all of us are sharing the same experience with that, so, yeah, I just wanted to share that. I think, uh, you know, love language is big Hmong parents, if they, you look to high Lalua, like, they show their love because they cook for you, right, or they do things for you, access services, you know, and things like that, and so it's just been really fun to have uh, kids and so seeing my mom and my dad as grandparents because but they learn a few things and one of them is kuluka, right but it's not kuluka, it's kuluka. and so they'll go bye bye kuluka. And, my, and the first time my mom heard she's like no that's you need to I said, Mom, I have Guluka. And so my mom's like, Guluka too. And so to hear my mom say that, like, I'm 40, all my life, I never heard it like that, right? Or the fill up, you like, you like, you're like, oh my God, you say it like that. I don't feel the love, but 
the, but you never hear them saying it to you in like um, you know like a party way you know on the first day long you know look on you know but they say it to the grandkids and so it's so uh, it sounds so foreign and even for them it feels foreign to say it, but it's really neat and really sweet to see them trying right because trying and making that effort is uh, so important and um, but I think too uh, whenever um, as a teenager we have all of these you know, angst with our, fa our, fa our parents, like, they don't understand me, you know, I have all these emotions going on, I'm a teenager, and, you know, hormones and everything, and then you read the story, and you go, they didn't have time for this when they were teens to have feelings, they were trying to, like, stay alive, you know, so the feelings of, you know, uh, whispering sweet nothings, like, Guluka, like, that wasn't important, and, like, uh, the whole time that her parents are courting and married, I don't know that they ever talked about it, it was just understood that Yushinko, but, so for me, you know, like knew you were sharing, like, you know, just starting it and, you know, it'll eventually catch on. And so my kids did it on their own. And, and at first my parents were kind of weirded out by it because that, that's just not something they ever said, even to their own children. And then it was really sweet that my, my kids are pretty persistent. It's always cool. And so now they say it all the time. And um, it's nice to see that shift and, you know, just um, being more comfortable with saying those very simple things like, I love you. That's really sweet. Um, I want to say, you know, like that shows, I think that shows that you, even though like your parents can say a lot to you, like, I love you to you. Like it shows that you say it enough to your kids that your kids are now reciprocating that to their grandparents. So I think that's like a, a clap snaps for you, you know, like you did that for them. Does anybody have anything else they want to share? I know this one went a little bit long, but it got a little bit emotional. All right. So for our next uh, question. <clears throat> so this one's a little bit interactive. Um, so in the chat, go ahead and just like do a brain dump, a brain dump of all the words that you can think of um, that describe the book, that describe the character, that describe a feeling. And then I'm going to put all those words into a word cloud. And then we're going to look at these words and discuss some of these words, discuss what they mean to us, what they mean to the story. Um, so yeah, I'll just give you guys a couple of minutes to do a huge brain dump.
So these are the words that popped up um, multiple times up here. So we've got love showed up two times, strength, hope, family, dreams, or dream. And then these are some that also popped up over here. Um, so just take a, a minute to think about these words and what they mean to you or what they mean to the book or how it kind of connects to each other. <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, we'll go around and kind of share, if you'd like, share, um, you know, your opinions, your thoughts on these words. Um, I can go first. I think one of the words that really stood out to me is strength. Um, cause it does take so much strength to go through everything that they went through. And I can't even imagine like all the trauma that, you know, they were holding on to and that affected them. And yet they still, had the strength to live on. Um, yeah, I really like that one. Um, to kind of, I guess, kind of go along to kind of go along with that. I um, would kind of highlight the word hope because a lot of what they're doing is just based on the hope that things will get better. That if they do this, then it'll get better for them. If they go here. You know, it'll be better for them, you know. Um, so I think this word is has a deeper meaning, you know, you know, deeper than I mean, I guess if we just threw the word around casually, but this a lot of what they're doing is just based on the hope that things get better, you know. They have to cross this scary river that has taken so many people, but the hope is if they get across, then it's a better life for them. They have to live in this refugee camp for years where you know, the sewage canal is literally living in their backyard. It's flowing in their backyard. They have an aluminum tin on their roof, but it's for the hope that, you know, they get to live a happier life. They get to raise their children in a better, in a better community, in a better country. Um, so I think that word is one that I would highlight. I think for me was family. Family really stuck out the way that, especially when they were living, going through the jungle and everything like that there was like i think at one point when she had first um come to his side of the family she's like how many there are you and he, she's like he's like 81 and she's like there's so many he's like yeah we want to keep it that way you know and the fact that like she came from a large clan a large family as well you know they all traveled together from it was very intergenerational and there was a mother a matriarch at the head of both of the families right both fathers had um, passed away a long time ago and like the way that their family unit um, operated and like stuck together and like um even when they were rescued in the from the enemy camp how like it was very everyone was carrying everyone's children and they were running like as a as a unit coming through to the jungles and stuff like that like i thought that the way that's very like that's a very foreign concept in America. I think that family would be such a strong um, system of support. So. All right. Would anybody else like to share? Yes, I would like to go. Um, so the word that sticks out to me the most and even when people ask me like, oh, you know, you're reading this book, like, what's it like? Uh, to me, it's a dream. So I, so this is the first book that I've read from Calculia. And I feel like the whole time I'm reading this book, especially um, the first, the first part, um, it just feels like a dream. It feels like it's all a dream. And it's so weird because I've 
heard like the way that my family, like my mom and my grandma, like even some of the ways that they've described like their life back then, like when they used to live in Laos, like they're always like, don't go to you know, like they always say that, like that's always a word that they always use. And so I also think that it's just, I don't know if it's um, intentional or if it's just kind of like coincidence that I also feel like as I'm reading, it's like, it's like a dream. And I feel like um, it's kind of, I'm starting to see that theme a little bit too and uh, especially the part right now where they're in America and she kind of um, you know the main character the mom she's talking about how she missed you know things from her past or uh, when she used to live here it was like this but now that she's in America it's like this and uh, it's almost like she's in like a dreamlike state in some of these like parts of the book where she's recalling her feelings or her memories from those times like whether it was an easier time or a harder time um you know it just feels kind of like a dream so yeah that's just something that really stuck out to me um yeah I love these words I would say family really um popped um, up for me I feel like you know, she was talking a lot about like all her, it was so, it was like, I needed a picture of a family tree um, because it was about all the people, all the people. It just made me think about like how in Hmong culture, it's about relationships and who you're related to. And um, like even like random, you know, towards, uh, I think in the refugee camps, at some point, like she paused her story and she was like, oh, and then all these stories of people, like she just threw them in there. I'm like, wait, where are we going? Who are these people? And then you learn that like they are related to some you know, somebody and it was about their lives. And um, so I, I just think about like the power of our connections, um, right? She talked a lot about her immediate family and then now the, the strangers, right? That she has become family with, her in-laws and then their relationships and then her family's relatives who she kind of ran to when they were having issues with her um, husband and um and would reconnect with you know nieces or nephews who were in America so I just thought a lot about like family connections in relation like everybody is somehow related to everybody um and like these all these stories of these family members are so important to understanding the context of the story. Um, so anyways, I that kind of like popped up for me. Thank you guys for, I know there's a lot of different meanings that we can come up with for these words, a lot of different connections, but um, I really appreciate you guys, you know, taking the time to do this with us. Uh, we did go over an hour a little bit, but let me go, oops, hold on, give me one second. Okay. All right, so I believe this is the last question. All right. Okay, so is there any other questions or points or um, parts in the book that you know we didn't get to talk about that you want to talk about or if you want to make it just a quick comment about it oh no, the there was one um I think it was in the refugee camps but there was a many parts where she talked a lot about her relationship with her husband and I just thought about like how lonely so many Hmong women, right, of that, in particular, that particular generation uh, must have felt like, who do you go to, to talk about your problems with your husband, right? You're so far away from your mom and your relatives, but you're with all these new strangers. And like, the, you know, like her whole like internal conversation with herself, the mom, her mom, about like, I'm just going to divorce this guy. I'm just going to say this is enough, right? And then at the end, she's like, but all we have is each other. So I, I just thought about like 
the strength, you know, I, I think we hear this all the time in Hmong culture, like, got you washing they, um, and I, I, they never use that language in the book, but I felt it. Like she had to just wash in they to kind of like keep on being persistent and resilient and moving through these really hard, difficult times. Like it was even some, you know, and she talked about like a lot of the, the couples would, were, were fighting in the refugee camps, right? Having marital problems. And um, so it, it was, we haven't really talked about like the husband and wife relationship, but that was definitely hard to kind of witness. Like I really appreciated how authentic and honest and truthful her mom has been about what was it like to be a young wife um, and not in being unhappy, being unhappy now with kids, living with strangers, the living the nyan life and um, having really no one to go to and just feeling like this is the only possible thing is to, to stay. I mean, she entertained some other options. Um, so anyways, I, I wondered what you all thought about like the husband and wife relationship there. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting how, you know, this goes back to like, we don't really talk about our emotions with each other type thing. Um, but like, you know, they never said like, I love you or, you know, you're the one for me, you're it, you know? Um, but it kind of showed in the way they, they did things or the way they remembered things about each other. Um, like how she was like, oh, I noticed that he's wearing clothes that are borrowed. I'm going to buy him a shirt. And then he's like, and he saves that shirt that she buys him for like a day that they're going to take pictures because that, that's a special item. Or, you know, she really wants papaya and she gets money and her husband says to her, like, you have money now, go buy the papaya. Um, but then she chooses not to. Like those little things, I think, show that, you know, they, they're sticking together. Um, or even when she's like, I'm going to, I'm going to leave. You can stay here with your mom if you'd like, but I'm going to leave. And then he decides, you know, I'm, I'll follow you. You know, those are little, little instances where I think it shows their relationship a little bit better, even though they might not say like, I love you, or they might hold in their feelings a little bit. I think, I think those little moments are what really make the relationship stronger. Yeah, I remember there was one part in the book that said, um, they found like a field of cucumbers and he purposely like found us a, 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 a very small, like intimate, like a and so, and he saved it for her and she was like, so like grateful and she was trying to express it to him and he was trying to like downplay it and say no. And he, he seemed to be kind of like embarrassed about it because he, it showed like he was so in favor to her and showing love to her, you know, and expressing his feelings towards her. But he kind of was like, no, it's not a big deal. Don't make it a big deal, you know. But I thought it was very sweet and very innocent because, you know, even like nowadays, like you don't see that kind of intimacy amongst Hmong people anymore, you know, because like, it still like, it's, it shows your love, you know, so. That's true. And you all saying that reminded me when she tried to commit suicide. And she was at the hospital and she woke up. I think it was, I think he had said something that like made her not feel shameful that she did that. Right. I think he kind of took the burden on and he said something like, oh, maybe because I haven't been a, as good of a husband, um, I will try better, you know, like and she was like, oh, the little that little bit that he had said to her made her. It was sad and loving at the same time, you know, it, it, it's just like relationships are super hard. They are super hard. Um. But just it it also made me think about like in relationships, it's like it it's so hard because you have to figure out with each other what is our couple, and then you have to figure out what do I want, what do you need, right? As a human being, as an individual, and so attending to all those three things can be really challenging to do, and you just see them struggle and move through uh, all the things that you all mentioned together. Like, it just reminded me, like, relationships are not perfect. It's a constant work in progress, you know. But Kalkali wrote about it so well. 
you we're all going through ups and downs with them <laughs> in the book. Oh, I love that you say that we're all going through with them because I remember like when she was feeling that I was like, oh, like frustration, like between both of them, you know, like what are they doing? Um, but then the what you're talking about, I think it's on page 139 um, where he says, like right when she wakes up, he says, it was all too much. You've gone through too much. If I could give you a better life, I would. I'm sorry. I can't. I have little to offer you. And then she says, he freed me from shame with his words. Is that the part you're talking about? Yeah. Just like those those words, I think just him admitting or him acknowledging, you know, his, like what he's done, um, even if it's like not 100% his fault, like both of them could definitely be communicating. Um, but I think just that him saying that, him acknowledging that definitely shows, you know, their relationship. Yeah, definitely. Like, it was hard to, to read and see that. Um, because like, it's so, it's so real. And like, it, it's so relatable like, for me, because I am married. Um, like, it just showed, showed just like how human we are. But I also was so amazed by like, even though they were even though they were going through rough spots, they persisted in in their relationship. And I think it, it just took a lot of time, you know, figuring out how to communicate to each other and how to understand each other, just like any other couple. But to see to see their relationship go through the um adversities that they did and for them to come out stronger it was just I did admire that aspect of it. All right. Um, any other points or the part of the story that we didn't talk about that you'd like to talk about? All right. So this is our special announcement. Once again, she is coming. So prepare your questions. Um, so that we can do a little uh, question and answer with her. We can do a little activity with her. Um, and I, I will be sharing the Google form right after this on Facebook and I'll send it through email. And then that final meeting is going to be on July 25th at 7 p.m. She's given us an hour of her time. Um, and so roughly we'll be talking about chapters 20 to 29, but overall just the book in general. Um, if you've read any of her other books, you can ask questions about that book if you'd like or about her future works, because um, I know she's got some planned. Um, so, yes, 